wow, this is a big theater. <laughs> Imagine yourself standing up on this stage. Think what a challenge it might be if you were asked to memorize a bunch of lines and perform them in front of 500 or so people. Now imagine that you had to act those lines with feeling and sing. Even for a seasoned performer, that would be a tall order. But now imagine that those lines expressed some of the most intimate and painful truths about your own life. Take it a step further and imagine that you had to do it without any of the support networks you're used to. You're away from friends and family. You're on new and unpredictable medication regimens because your body is struggling with recovery from drug addiction and life on the streets. And here you are. Go. Well, that's what 15 remarkable women from N Street Village did on the Kennedy Center stage in 2012. And I want to show you some of what that journey looked like. The work coming out of N Street Village from our acting students here is some of the most beautiful work that I've ever seen on any stage. Right now, we have a, a blank page and you have to find you know, what works for you. What I really wanted from doing something like this was connection. Because to me, that's what theater is really about, connecting to other people. I lost my connection with time, family, loved ones, I mean, my goals, everything. I lost out of everything. I lost my job, I lost my, my car. I lost my apartment after 22 years when we were crap. From one day, this intelligent woman working at the bank to becoming the end of job, I stay at home and smoke my unemployment check up. It's your first step back to getting your life back. That's the beauty of this opportunity. I didn't know. And you fix it by being your best self. After I heard all your stories, I felt like I had so much in common with you all, but I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't sat down in that circle. Tonight is your night to bring them into a world that they must see, and they will be forever changed. And if there are people who aren't used to hearing these stories, well, then they need to hear them. If there are people who know you, who have heard some version of your story, but never this one, never this one about how hard you work to get to this place where you are so brave that you will go out there to put it all on the line, to help other people. Well, then that's the story they get to hear tonight. I done went from Kennedy Street to Kennedy Slump. Look at me now. How I got over How did I make it over You know my soul Look back and wonder How I got over It was an amazing moment when the women took that stage. Uh, but I want to back up for a bit and tell you a little bit about what it took to get there. I am one of the directors of the Theater Lab School of the Dramatic Arts in Washington, DC, where we teach acting to adults and kids who set out to study that kind of thing. But we also created a program called Life Stories, where we teach people who don't usually have much of a voice in our society, incarcerated youth, seniors in assisted living facilities, immigrant teens, to create original dramatic works using their real life experiences. 
And about five years ago, we started partnering with N Street Village, a recovery and wellness center for homeless and low-income women. And as you could see on the video, our students from N Street face multiple challenges, drug addiction, histories of trauma, mental illness, years in prison, and they're also terrific actors. For years, I had been watching the work of the women of N Street and thinking, you know, this stuff is life-changing. I mean, not just for the participants, but also for the people who are lucky enough to see it. The only thing is, not many people got to see it because we were inside a shelter. So we decided to dream big. You know, what if we created an original play using the women's own words, starring the women themselves, and what if we put it on one of the greatest stages in the world? It seemed like a great idea. Two years and many twists and turns later, we were on our way to the Kennedy Center. At our first rehearsal for this extra ambitious Life Stories project, we sit down in a circle. Me, Tom Workman, the extraordinary artist and teacher that you saw on the film, and 14 women, many of whom have no idea what they're getting into. Oh, and I forgot to mention that along the way, we had attracted an Academy Award-nominated documentary producer who decided that she wanted to direct a film about the project. So at this first meeting, there are cameras and boom mics everywhere as the women, some of whom are just released from prison or not even 30 days off the street, are trying to decide if they want to trust us with their stories or anything else. But Tom got us off to a pretty smooth start, and he began by exploring the women's earliest memories. And they were eager to share stories, even the hard ones. I mean, these were stories of incest, uh, deprivation, violence, and how, in the words of one of the participants, it just wasn't safe being a girl child round my way, which became one of the opening lines of the play. And these stories just kept coming for weeks. Tom helped the women act them out, and we brought in a playwright to record their words and to structure them into a script. And then I took over as the director of the play. And things came to a screeching halt. Many of the women couldn't read the words, even though they were their own, had no memory of saying them. They were exhausted by rehearsals. And we never had the whole cast together until the day before performance, because there were doctor's appointments to treat liver damage and HIV, group therapy hours, constant illnesses and infections. People were fighting for their lives, even as we were trying to put on a play. And I started to wonder, why are we doing this? Why are we stressing out really fragile people? Because I had some dream of going to the Kennedy Center. But about five weeks into the process, a new member of the group appeared. Her name was Petrina. She was quiet, very polite, never asked for any attention. Uh, but then one day, Tom asked her to tell her story. And she did. Uh, she told a version of it where nothing unusual happened. She was just a quiet, shy person who went to work and kept to herself. And Tom asked Petrina, you know, how did she come to this place in her life? She couldn't make sense of that, you know, which was unusual because everyone else could pinpoint exact moments where they felt like things had started to unravel. But Tom just stayed with her, listening, and eventually she said, well, there was something when I was 16. And she starts to tell this story about being gang raped at gunpoint by a boy she liked and five of his friends. And she never told a soul. She just went on as if nothing had happened. And as this story is now tumbling out of her, she realizes, like in the middle of telling it, that she's not the loner that she had always thought she was, but just someone who had shut herself off from people because she didn't want to talk about it. She didn't want to think about it. I'm 56 years old, she said, and I've been so afraid, and that's sad because I have so much inside of me to share. It was devastating. 
And, and I felt like I should say something, you know, offer some words of comfort or some direction for her piece because we were supposed to be doing a theater project. Uh, but before I got two words out, I was literally choking back sobs. And I'm so embarrassed because nobody else is crying. So I say something idiotic like, you know, I'm sorry, this is obviously affecting me, but I can keep working while I cry. And I look up and I, I see that from across the room, one of the women, Rose, is, is coming towards me. And she wraps me in this huge bear hug. And suddenly I'm surrounded by all the women, including Petrina, just like squishing me in the center of their circle. And I'm thinking, oh God, why are they comforting me? <laughs> this is so wrong. And I hear Rose say, you see, we're more alike than we are different. And it, it was the simplest truth, but also the greatest revelation for me. And it's why theater exists in the first place, to connect us, because sometimes we forget how alike we are. A great teacher I know says that theater is where your story meets my story and becomes our story. And I realized that up until that moment, I had been standing outside of everybody's story, you know, trying to say the right thing, offer a positive experience, but never really acknowledging that in some ways they were telling my story too. Not in the specifics. You know, I had been lucky to have been a lot safer in my childhood, that's for sure. But in the feelings of failure and hope, loss and redemption, you know, the striving, that was our story. Flash forward a few weeks. We are walking down a grand red carpeted foyer on our way to see the Terrace Theater at the Kennedy Center for the first time. And Petrina is walking beside me and she's beaming. She says, I can't believe this is happening. It's like coming out of a long darkness and into the light. A week later, she was standing on that stage performing a monologue about a traumatic memory that she had repressed for 40 years. And we wondered, you know, is, is this therapeutically a good idea? And I asked her, are you sure you want to make yourself so vulnerable, so publicly? And she said, I can't wait. And when I asked why, she said, because there might be another woman out there like me and I want her to know she's not alone. And I thought, well, that really is the best reason I ever heard for an actor to take the stage. And she did. And she was stunning. I mean, they all were, all those difficult hours and weeks of rehearsal. And then they stepped into their light. And they were these 15 beautiful artists. They belonged at the Kennedy Center. But the most dramatic moment of the evening came towards the end of the show, when one of the older women, Lolita, a former crack addict who had become a leader in the group, forgot her lines on her closing monologue. And in it, she had prepared this special message for her daughter. So she starts out and she says, I know I don't have all the answers, but I want and she just stops and she stands there for about 15 seconds and then she collapses into the arms of one of the other women sobbing and the audience starts to applaud you know determined to let her know that it's okay but I know what she was planning to say and I'm not sure she's ever going to get another opportunity to say this to her daughter so Without really thinking about it, I just jump out of my front row seat and yell out, Lolita, what do you want your daughter to say? And without missing a beat, Lolita stands straight up and says, I want my daughter to be able to look at me and say, that's my mom. And just as the crowd is starting to erupt, in the back of the theater, her daughter stands up, pumps her fist, and shouts out, that's my mom! It was 
the single greatest moment of theater, well, really, of life, that I have ever experienced. When we become the storytellers of our lives, we are no longer victims of circumstance. We are artists who make things happen, who write the next chapter, who change the ending. Tom Workman says that sometimes our stories are all we have left, which really makes you appreciate what a generous gift it is to share them. Thank you. Thank you.